I'm Bob Buer. I do uh, my day job is as a, as a credit analyst. That means I talk to people who buy and sell bonds and hold them for investment purposes. I've been doing this for a couple of decades now. Uh, the people I talk to uh, generally don't show up at these things. Who here is from the bond world? Aha! Oh, so we got one person there. So that, or two actually. This, so that, that's an improvement. We're already about a 50% improvement over every other group like this that I've been to the last five years. Because generally the only person is Mike Wilkins. And he, he left. So. Um, uh, the thing about bond investors that uh, is paramount is that our risks are asymmetric. Uh, we buy bonds at par, and we, you know, they might go up a bit, they might go down a little bit, but we're always facing a possible loss of 100% uh, without a corresponding potential increase in value of 100%. So that basically guides our, uh, our view of the world, um, which I'm going to present now if I've got the right which is the one that I, does anybody know? Oh, here we are, okay. This is stolen from S&P, uh, Moody's and Fitch have something similar. This is basically a well-developed model of how, to, of how credit risks and ratings are derived. And it's basically a process of looking, of, of sorting risks into a couple of different buckets, basically business risk and financial risk. Uh, We've got a couple of examples of each, but actually the lists are much longer than that. Uh, and actually, sometimes the categories can go back and forth across the two. But this is a tried and true method that people who work at rating agencies have used, including me. I was at Moody's for a number of years. Uh, and people who do bond stuff not at rating agencies and would do the same thing because our job is basically to try to anticipate uh, what the rating agencies are going to do because that's how we make money. Uh, and this has actually been a fairly successful model for the last three or four decades. So your average bond manager, say, is usually a guy. He's got his, uh, in England, he's probably got his uh, BA in finance from Cass or Manchester. And then he's gone off and gotten his CFA, which means he's, his mind is blissfully untouched by the notion of <laughs> externalities. So he's sitting there. He's comfortable in the second quartile. And he's just kind of plodding along. But suddenly, his world has gotten very messy because what's happened is he's starting to see lists like this. And he's being told that you know he needs to respond. He needs to tell the clients how his portfolio approach deals with these sorts of things. So we've got some. This is actually comes out of a publication put out by uh, the Fixed Income Working Group, I think that was that's the correct title, uh, of the Principles of Responsible Investment. Uh, they put out a couple of publications. This is from 2013. They did an update in 2014, which looks frightening. Uh, now, you're this bond manager, right? You're in your second quartile, and you're trying to figure out, well, what do I do with all this? Uh, OK, I can track health and safety. I can track diversity. So generally, the response is, the first thing they do, and because it's not, it's not clear why, he's, he's also uncertain as to why he's being asked to do this. Uh, usually it's because his firm has signed up for the PRI without having a clue what that actually really entails. Uh, uh, once they figured it out, then the managers start going, mm, okay. Uh, so he looks at this, and of course he's trying to figure out what biocapacity even means. Uh, and I've been looking at this list, and I actually spent a couple of months last year looking at this list because I thought it encapsulated something kind of interesting about the whole ESG issue, uh, which hasn't actually penetrated the fixed income world very strongly. Uh, the first thing RPM does, by the way, is he calls up equity research and says, what do you have on this? And they oh, we got lots of stuff. So they said, can you send it over? And they send it over, and it's, of course, all the screening stuff from MSCI. So he's even, now, now he's even more confused, and plus he's got information overload. So he's looking at this, and if he's sharp, i.e. like me, he's <laughs> noticed that actually there's a couple of themes here. And the first theme is that practically everything under the social and governance buckets here, and actually some of the environmental stuff, really come down to one kind of risk, if we're talking about risk, and that's management risk. Is management doing <coughs> his job? Is management staying out of legal trouble? Is it anticipating technological changes? 
Uh, is it doing what you want management to be doing to steer a firm through the silly and interests of the business world? So actually, that's basically one kind of risk. And if you and if you've got trustworthy management who's actually doing this sort of thing, uh, you know, uh, Volkswagen, you know, <laughs> uh, then of course you're going to have. Uh, some level of comfort that actually these are issues that are being dealt with. Now, from a bondholder's point of view also, the reason why this list may be important is because if my risks are asymmetric, the main thing I'm worried about is an unanticipated downgrade because that's the thing that's going to lose me money and my client, uh, which is probably some pension fund. Um, so I'm going to be looking at this list and thinking, what here is going to possibly produce a downgrade? Now, you know, human rights, you know, child labor is a, a, a gruesomely awful thing. But you know what? The dirty secret is that no one's going to get downgraded because of child labor. <laughs> Sorry. Employer relations, on the other hand, it turns out that in the mining industry, monitoring how many employees a company kills every year is actually a reasonable metric to look at. And actually, that is the kind of thing that uh, agencies will take into consideration in looking at whether or not management is actually doing the job it's supposed to be doing. Product responsibility and health and safety, I'm not quite sure, you know, some of these are a little nebulous probably, but product <laughs> responsibility is, you know, are you, are you not producing products that are going to kill people? Okay, because that's the kind of thing that certainly will produce a downgrade. So consumer relations, I don't know if we have litigation risk in here anywhere, but it should be. So that's basically one kind of risk, and my position here is that you know, that's basically what you want management to be doing, is paying attention to those things. However, if we look at the environmental side, it gets a little bit more complicated because we do have things like climate change. Now, I'd submit actually there's no such thing as climate change risk. It's actually a collection of half a dozen different kinds of risks, some of which are proceeding more rapidly than others. Biodiversity, well, that's actually a different animal entirely. That's not even a global warming kind of category. That's actually another kind of category entirely. So. Uh, you know, biocapacity, ecosystem quality, you know, water pollution is actually a management risk, is management controlling those things, I understand that. Uh, you know, so where I end up here is that we basically got three different kinds of risks that we're looking at in this, in this uh, domain. Uh, operational risks, which just sounds a little bit snazzier than management risks, climate risks, and natural capital risks. So we've actually applied this uh, to a number of sectors uh, so far. It's a bit like half the papers here. It's a work in progress, which is nice. Um, uh, so how do we actually? How does this actually work? Well, if we just take environmental risks, for example, you know, what are the risks here? That, particularly the risks that might potentially produce a downgrade. Well, regulatory compliance risks are critical here. And certainly, you know, my own background is as an American, so I'm more familiar with the US landscape here than others. Uh, but, you know, Obama's Clean Air Program is, uh, is, you know, that's a regulatory compliance risk that you would expect managers to be able to deal with or not. Uh, you know, other regulatory risks, fine. Um, you know, whether or not the 6.5 billion euros that VW has reserved so far is going to be sufficient. But that's the bucket that that would actually fall into. And certainly VW's case in point of litigation risk. But every single pharmaceutical com uh, company is going to be a similar kind of situation. And in fact, pharmaceutical companies have been downgraded for the last 15 years pretty regularly simply because of litigation risk. This is, you know, it's, everyone likes to think it's a nice safe industry. It's not. Um, so the task here, really, as an analyst for me and, this, and, and for our, uh, our portfolio manager is to say, Take what these risks are and try to figure out what the economic impacts of the materializing actually is. Because that's when I'll be able to map them onto my financial risk uh, model of the company. Because my financial risk model of the company is going to be, I have certain expectations about it maintaining credit ratios in, within certain bounds over a period of time. What's going to disturb that materially? And from a rating agency perspective, what's going to disturb it material enough to produce a downgrade? So in the case of environmental uh, issues here, we've got, you know, the economic impacts range from reputational risk and license to operate. The Barrick Gold example we heard about this morning, actually at lunchtime I discovered this article from Buenos Aires about 
Barakal now admitting that the cyanide spill in some river in Argentina was actually five times larger than they initially indicated that it was. Um, we've got a management issue here, clearly. Uh, you know, uh, regulatory compliance costs are starting to become embedded uh, here. Uh, possible loss of business and acid impairment. Um, now, I need to be careful here on acid impairment because you know acids get impaired all the time, and I think. I'm trying to be very cautious on using the term stranded assets as opposed to asset impairment or just asset declines because assets decline all the time. Uh, stranded assets imply that there's still an economic life to that asset, but in fact, a lot of what, you know, some of the examples that I'm, I'm going to be talking about, it's borderline whether or not that's really the case. So anyway, the point is that once I have, once I've identified some of the economic costs associated with these issues, I can then map them onto the particularly operating margins, uh, particularly in terms of potential liability provisions, uh, and whether or not there's going to be any asset impairments. That's what's going to tell me whether or not I'm running any particular downgrade risks or not. Uh, and actually, it turns out that for social and governance, the process is pretty much exactly the same. Climate risks. What does that look like? Well, you know, for sheer, for, from sheer lack of uh, initiative, uh, I broke that down into mitigation risks and adaptation risks. Carbon pricing is still a major risk. I, you know, I, I've sort of given up on the notion of ever, of us ever really getting a real carbon price. But uh, if we did, it's clearly going to be significant for a number of industries, uh, particularly in terms of energy costs. Uh, other carbon risks, uh, extraction costs have been going through the roof. Uh, this mention was made yesterday. By whom, but of the recent Wood McKenzie report that has identified $1.5 trillion of CapEx projects that should not proceed. Um, these are big projects. These are like what's going on in northern Canada. This is like offshore stuff. And McKinsey's actually been tracking this for a number of years. And so, you know, the, the, the size of uh, EMT projects in the fossil fuel industry. And it's been, you know, it's, you know your average project now is, you know, double digit billion. Uh, that's the kind of stuff that's going to cancel down. Uh, we've got other mitigation costs. Uh, adaptation risks are actually, you know, as time goes on, we'll be moving more and more over to the right, I suspect, here. Uh, but this is really things like, you know, what do we do with that stuff on coasts uh, and rivers? Um, uh, and, you know, the way we've been dealing with it up to now is by ignoring it, but eventually we'll have to start dealing with it in terms of insurance and taxes and regulatory costs. Uh, event risks like Sandy and Ebola. Uh, societal risks, I've kind of, there's no line there. Um, but probably a good example of that is the impact of a three year drought in Syria seven years later, uh, which is what we're seeing now. Um, and whether or not we'll see more of those things in the future, which I suspect is that we will. So again, the deal is we can you know, come up with the economic impacts and map them onto, again, you know, our, our, our boilerplate candidates of operating costs and margins, potential asset impairments. Uh, what I, I probably should have included a uh, right, uh, 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 potential litigation reserve here, uh, but it's uh, hard to see them arising. Uh, Okay, finally, natural capital risk. This is sort of a new category because the concept of natural capital is relatively recent. Uh, but it's actually a very useful one because it captures a lot of stuff. In particular, it captures, for example, the kind of stuff that Kate was talking about this morning with water scarcity. Uh, water scar scarcity is a huge issue, and we are seeing it affect the mining industry. In fact, the agencies have all put out, well, no, both Moody's and s and have put out pieces on potential water impacts on the mining industry and the fact that these are clearly not going to be positive for ratings, they're going to be negative. Uh, you know, we've got the fossil fuel de the depletion, I'm trying to avoid fossil fuel discussions because we kind of, they're wallowing in it. Uh, then we have renewable and non-renewable resources. I just sort of call your attention <laughs> to the fact that McKinsey has actually been doing yeoman work the last couple of years on commodities and in spite of a lot of softness in a lot of commodities right now, uh, the long-term trends are for steadily increasing commodity prices over time, even with no global warming kind of adjustments. Uh, and, you know, factoring on a change in carbon pricing on top of that is just, you know, just blows everything up. You know, at 150 years of cheap energy, there's no way that continues, uh, unless it goes politically. 
uh, which is sort of the problem. Again, so, so what else we got here? We got geopolitical event risks, uh, rare earth minerals, the whole hula on that over a couple of years uh, ago. You'll remember everything's in China. Well, it isn't really. But we do have this interesting situation with phosphorus, phosphate fertilizer is integral to the modern agricultural system. Uh, 70 to 80% of known phosphorus resources are in Morocco. Most of the rest are in places like Egypt. Um, is this an issue? We'll see. Uh, we got political instability. Global warming impacts. Um, this is not, I've sort of put this in here because it's the kind of, here's where I'm thinking we're going to see impacts in terms on forests and agriculture and fisheries in particular from the longer term impacts. Now, is this a stranded acid issue? Probably not, but it's, it's, it's an issue. Uh, and then we have subsidy risks. Uh, and I was very pleased to hear this, the subsidy discussions uh, uh, so far, uh, because this is huge. Um, and it actually makes sense to think that more would be accomplished by eliminating subsidies and making economic costs closer to what they really are. Uh, than anything else we could do. Uh, uh, how likely that is is an open question. So anyway, it's the same drill here, uh, and we can again come down with uh, some assessments on whether or not this is going to have any real impact on credit ratings or not. Uh, and so, so far, it has, in, but only in very limited cases. Uh, water industry, uh, coal industry, metals and mining, we're starting to see it. Uh, over the longer term, I suspect we'll see more. So, two minutes. Yeah, okay. So, where do stranded assets come from? Now, where are we likely to find stra stranded assets emerging? Well, regulatory risk is a real one. I mean, we're, you know, the coal industry, uh, this is a regulatory risk. Now, this is, <coughs> shouldn't have been unanticipated, uh, but, but regulatory risk is going gonna, is gonna, is gonna to be with us for a long time. Uh, carbon pricing risk may or may not materialize. If it does, there's a, a whole bunch of industries I can think of, starting with airlines, maritime transportation, um, uh, the cement industry, the list goes on, uh, where, costs, where the cost dynamic changes radically. Um, adaptation risk, my favorite example here is railroads. Uh, and I've got a slide that shows this. So actually, I'll hold up on that for a second. Uh, depletion risk. Uh, water depletion is, is an issue, but it's not, it's not the only thing that's being depleted. We are, we are seeing a lot of non ferrous We have a lot of metals depletion going on. That, and our time frame here is longer, of course. I mean, we're talking a couple of decades, but, uh, and I'll be retired. But, uh, but these are real risks. Uh, the global warming impact on natural resources, again, I'm not sure I would say this is a stranded asset, but it is a, certainly something where we're seeing uh, assets, asset values being affected. And subsidy loss risk, which is a political issue entirely, and, and whether or not that ever materializes, um, you know, I, I, I hope it does, actually. We'll see. And now, how does this work in practice? Uh, just very briefly, one of the claims I would not make about this approach is that it's elegant. Uh, uh, because what I've done here is I've looked at uh, transportation, um, airlines, the marine transport industry, and rail operators. Uh, in terms of these various categories, and just sort of broken things down, and just basically to cut to the chase here. Uh, uh, stranded asset risks. Okay, airlines probably low. This is counterintuitive, but you know what assets do airlines own? Well, they actually don't have all that many assets. They often don't own their fleets. They're owned by ILFC or GE or something like that. Uh, they may own their slots at the airport, but they probably don't own the airports. So that, you know, and they've got reputation. Uh, uh, um, so, you know, where's, where do stranded asset risks arise here? Well, they don't. Marine transport, uh, I enjoyed the paper this morning. Uh, I guess I'm a little bit less anxious about it, mainly because uh, the companies that I follow are generally the larger ones who are well capitalized and have newer, have newer fleets. Uh, but, uh, and ports actually appear to be the major candidate here, um, but ports are generally not owned by the freight transporters, they're generally owned by municipalities or port companies. So, railroads. Now this is the interesting one, because on the one hand, this is everyone's favorite mode of transport. Uh, it's, it's the most efficient way to move stuff around, clearly. Uh, 
problem is a lot of railroads are right there on the water. I gave a similar presentation to this last March in Washington, D.C., and I was traveling down from Boston, so I took the train. And, you know, for at least half the trip, you look at that, there's the water, right? There. It's right there. You know? so, so, and, you know, the U.K., you got a similar situation. I can't imagine, you know, there aren't other situations like that. You know, which raises the question, what do you do if you have to move a railroad? You know, moving an airport, you know, Logan Airport, which I fly in and out of all the time in Boston, you have to, you know, if they have to move that, well, that's easy. You know, they just move it higher ground in, inland somewhere. You know, what do you do if you have to move a railroad? You know, the scale of this is daunting. So, now, this, is this really a stranded acid issue or, well, it depends on whether or not those acids are still in the books. But it's such, just such a great problem to think about that I, I, I just felt that would mention it. So, uh, that's pretty much it. I'm done. Thank you. Thank you.